Yes, Matthew. Yeah, uh, Pillai. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, we are all set. Um, we, as you announced already, we are at Apollo. We have Ajit uh, as a, a cooperator and uh, Karunia. You can see the little one behind us. Uh, our staff nurse, uh, scrub nurse, one of the good ones. And we have uh, another two uh, big guys uh, on the radiologists, ra radiographers, uh, Andrew and Mile. Chris is uh, b uh, just behind, uh, standing by to make his comments on the imaging part. So Ajit, uh, you want to t talk about the history or? Uh, you want uh, he's, he's a, good, good, good morning everyone. Uh, he's a 77 year old gentleman. Uh, he's a diabetic hypertensive who presented to the hospital with uh, his history suggestive of unstable angina of short duration. Uh, angiography was done, which was so shown to have severe calcific triple vessel disease. Uh, he was admitted for a uh, surgical revascularization. But since he's pretty frail, he has a history of uh, lung disease and with uh, a, a, a borderline lung dysfunction on a pulmonary function test. He also has azotemia. Uh, the heart, there was a heart team approach to it, and it was decided that he undergo a multivessel PCI rather than subjecting him to a CABG. So the first stage uh, of the angioplasty was done uh, a couple of days ago and uh, we'll show you the films on the, uh, um, uh, as to what was done. Basically he had a critical lesion in the uh, right coronary artery which is a little uh, abnormally uh, rising, not exactly uh, in the, from, the, uh, from the normal position and he underwent a successful PTCA with deployment of one uh, stent to the uh, RCA. Are you getting the images on the uh, monitor there? Pillai? Yeah, we are, we are seeing the images. Do you have an OCT image or an IVS image on the RCA? Uh, no, unfortunately, we don't have an OCT image on the RCA. Okay. Um, I, I wish I could show you that uh, today we decided to go back and look at that uh, RCA images. Uh, you have the, uh, uh, can you show the RCA follow-up images uh, today? Okay. What actually we thought we will uh, do an OCT instead of doing an angiogram, which would anyway we were planning to do an OCT for the left. Uh, that time we didn't do it. Uh, we thought we will be able to get an OCT image now. Unfortunately, the difficulties, uh, as we already know of, tracking an OCT catheter or an IVS catheter in abnormal origins or when there is too much of abnormality at the ostium we tend to find it difficult, which wa happened today. You saw the wire already in place. We, uh, we couldn't get a OCT catheter in, so we decided to take two pictures, and that's, uh, that's what we did. And it looks good. There was uh, calcium in the right also, but it was a moderate calcium. We thought uh, we want to limit the usage of contrast. We used less than 100 cc of contrast for this. And we thought if we can get away with a balloon, we don't have to use a rotoblator that will again reduce the, uh, the dye load. As well as uh, OCT, <coughs> we did not consider at all that time because we need a second uh, procedure today. So right looks all right. We, we had a discussion before we started today. I sought opinion from Chris and Ajit. And uh, said uh, instead of doing an angiogram for the left, why not we combine that? That's a reasonable solution so that uh, we'll reduce the contrast load. This is the first angiogram. We have a OCT catheter in, in place in the circumflex. You saw two lesions. Uh, proximally is very reasonably tight and there is a second lesion at the posterior uh, branch calcium. which yeah. comes off at uh, 7 o'clock position in the mid segment. So this is what we have now, and I'll ask uh, Chris to comment on the OCT. Go ahead, Chris. Um, can you see the? Do you see the OCT images there? Can you shift to the OCT. OCT images, please. Yeah. Yep, you do. So obviously, the first thing is now that we've got uh, the long view uh, and the reconstructions, it's uh, often very easy just to go up uh, here to the uh, 
uh, reconstruction here and you can see the reference segments which you can move around a little bit if you want to and clearly the tightest segment is uh, down here proximally. Uh, so let's just uh, go through this as we go through. There's a bit of contrast right at the distal end but we can actually see what we need to hear uh, at the very distal end and we were able to get uh, an assessment of where we'd like to uh, put our stent distally which is around here and then as we pull back uh, you can see there's a lot of concentric plaque a lot of calcification uh, fibroatheroma and as we get uh, more proximally uh, a lot of cal calcific spicules uh, a fairly thick but isolated area of calcium here and the closer we get to the tight lesion we're getting a lot you know, is a plate of calcium sticking into the lumen um, more calcium. Uh, th this is more than 180 degrees but it's actually quite thin here so uh, we thought this would certainly be able to crack it just with pre-dilatation and didn't think we'd need to do a rotor here. Um, there was some talk of whether we should do an FFR to this lesion because sometimes circumflexes uh, look worse than they actually are but when you head down uh, right to the actual part of the critical lesion, it's catheter hugging and gave us a MLA of 0 0.9 millimeter squared. So by any accounts, that's really pretty tight. So finally, when we did our um, distal um, reference segment, uh, we got a value of about three. The uh, proximal. The proximal, I'm sorry, uh, three. And then we got, did a length we got a length of uh, 31.6 so we decided to go initially with a 2533 so we don't oversize the distal end and then hit the proximal end uh, with a 30 stent NC for good apposition and good stent sizing. Uh, you want any, anybody wants any clarity on the IVUS or and what we did is we'll just show the image what go back to the the angio images, please. Uh, sir, this is Dr. Pratap. Actually, uh, Pratap, tell me. all the uh, features suggest you of we should definitely do a atherectomy uh, because of the length of the calcium, the depth of the calcium, as well as the that is the arc is more than 180. So, uh, my question is actually, if we are putting a 2.533, after doing a rota, will you do a one more uh, OCT to identify the vessel lumen, whether it will be changed or not? No. Uh, I think, uh, Pratap, uh, if you look at the images, uh, most of the area, it is fibrocalcium rather than too much of calcium. Most of the calcium are deep inside the intima. The specules are there on the proximal part and uh, at various levels but no <coughs> uh, more than 180 degree or no arc in the intimal region. When we have uh, Im images like this, I tend not to use an autoblator because it's not likely to give us an optimal uh, result because the, if it was more on the, on the intimal, uh, uh, then yes, uh, it would have been very useful. Here, I thought we may get away with uh, without an uh, rotablation or any other plaque modification because the calcium is deep seated more in the intima, the media and adventitia. This is the only reason why we decided to go ahead without uh, a rotablation. So actually in a circumflex lesion, otherwise also if you are actually having one area of the vessel is without any calcium, we, uh, because of the complication chances, little higher than the LAD. So you always suggest us to, uh, to do rotablator in a uh, less aggressive level or? Uh, no, we, I mean, whether it's circumflex or LAD, uh, reaccessing a circ circumflex after a complication, yes, I agree it is technically more challenging. Here we took an NC balloon, there is no contraindication as you know to pull out the rotablator once we, uh, even after dilating or trial run of dilating with the balloon. So we decided to go with the 2.5 NC balloon because of the reasons I explained earlier. And you see the picture, the balloon opened quite well. Yeah. And next. 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 Matthew, in your experience in circumflex, if you are not planning for a rota, when would you use a different debulking device like a cutting balloon or a scoring balloon? 
you know, if uh, I, I feel the, there is a the, very unlikely that the balloon will go into open. So you have that avenue always open using an, or, or just plain NC balloon. And if it doesn't open, I will open up a, a cutting balloon or a scoring balloon, of course, yes. But here it opened reasonably well at a 12 atmospheres, 13 atmospheres. You can see here, now with the stand in position, we didn't have any difficulty tracking the stand. It opened quite okay. Next. So if a balloon fails, yes, we will pull out one of the devices. I, uh, I agree with you. So it opened quite well. Next. Okay. After that, we decided to do an uh, OCT run for you. And uh, Chris, uh, can I have yep. a look at the So OCT? if we can uh, display the OCT on the screen. OCT on the screen, please. Yep. So um, I'll just do a manual pullback here. Um, firstly, if you, um, we all talk about the rendered stent, and uh, if you look at the rendered stent here, you can see everything's white, but it's very important, one, uh, that if you're looking at it, that you actually rotate the stent right round. Uh, and if you rotate it, you can see, in fact, there are areas proximally where it looks like it is probably isn't particularly well opposed. So let's get the rendered uh, stent off and um, we'll move back. So the distal end looks really well opposed. Remember we size that as just uh, about 2.5. There's a, as expected, some dissections here at 2 o'clock as we pull back. Not too much pro prolapse, uh, well opposed stents. The size looks very satisfactory. Lumen area is about 4, which is very nice for a circumflex. Um, a lot of the dissection, interest and dissection, which is again uh, as expected. But as you know, we put a 2.5 stent in and we measured the proximal end at 3. So as you can see here, you have some uh, uh, malopause stents here. And in these areas, because you're getting a bit of tissue prolapse as well, the rendering may not give you an accurate assessment. So once you've done the rendering, it's always important just to do your usual manual thing. So here you can see there's a lot of plaque prolapse, but the stent is actually not opposed. And often the rendering will not work here because it sees this as vessel wall. So it's always important that you do a, a manual pullback as well. So as planned, we uh, went back in and said this was a 3.0 to begin with proximally, so we should hit it with a 3.0 NC at reasonable pressure for sizing and apposition. Any, any comments or any, any clarity you want? Uh, now we'll be, you'll be taking a three uh, post dilatation balloon, which that, is actually a non-compliant or a semi-compliant it, balloon? It's a non-compliant. Non because we know that uh, its uh, upper margin is 3, not uh, more than that. So we don't want an edge dissection because that is something which, di uh, which is disastrous. Next. And next. Next. We approximately we used a 3 millimeter balloon and, and mid-segment also at a lower pressure. Next. Dr. Pillai, can I ask a question? And, uh, Dr. Pillai, can I ask a yeah, question? One question from the floor, sir. Please go ahead. Dr. Matthew, yeah. uh, uh, when you see the angiogram post stenting, the proximal part also to the eye appears to be well opposed. Now in the normal setting, if you did not have OCT, uh, uh, would you have gone for a post dilatation or is it only because pro now the pro OCT pro finds? Pro probably I would agree with you. We would leave it alone. And now that the OCT is available, we want to make sure that we did the right thing. Okay. You are right. absolutely right. Next, what we did is uh, we tried to, we wired the LED and uh, you can see the mid-segment there is more calcium and we, this is the OCT catheter, it doesn't get in at all. Okay. It is getting stuck at the calcium. So I can't give you a no pre-OCT image. This is where we are today. And <coughs> go back, when an OCT catheter tip even doesn't get in, then there is no point in trying to get a microcatheter because that also will not cross. So here, ideally, you should have a rotablator because we are definite there is calcium which is visible on the screening itself and a gritty feeling even on the wiring and tip of the OCT catheter does not even reach uh, closer to the lesion.
Is it so, a regular wire or is it a uh, rotor wire? This is a regular wire and I have kept a rotor wire next to it because uh, these situations you should learn, all the people who are learning to do more and more rotor blade, you should uh, avoid using a micro catheter and exchange a wire in every uh, easy cases also. You should learn to uh, start wiring, bare wiring, because that will be save your day in many cases. So I just kept the wire there to just to show that bare wire also you can you can do though this wire is a very unfriendly wire that is into a diagonal once you have a wi another wire parked it is very easy without contrast you can easily parallelly wire it now what I intend to do is um, if uh, Ajit is ready in MMM you can go there if he is not ready you can stay back with me and uh, I'll uh, do the uh, I'm pulling the ordinary wire back the BMW is out rota is in place and we can stay back with us uh, till the rota and then go there and come back by the time we'll keep the OCT ready we'll have more information on the vessel by then uh, can we switch over to the lab If they are not ready, you can be with us. Any, any, uh, talk? if you are there, you need any clarity, any clarification, please go ahead uh, from the audience or from the panel. I mean, the, I, I heard that, yes, an ordinary normal wire and <coughs> it's much easier to use a rota wire parallelly because that wire stabilizes your axis. So actually two wires <coughs> taken in a calcified lesion, it's a very tight, complex, uh, tight lesion, whether you may be in trouble also, sometimes you may go into subindemide the other second wire, there is a chance there. Uh, I mean, yes, uh, here I did not do the, otherwise normally I would like to have um, um, a contrast injection which would give us the right uh, angle. Here, because of its compromised renal function, I, am, uh, I did not use a contrast. I am almost certain we are in the right place. So, so Matthew, I think uh, there are two aspects to whenever we watch Matthew. There is vast amount of experience which uh, goes into everything that he does and that cannot be compensated Can for any of the other aspects of whether we call it imaging, whether we call it technique. Uh, the second aspect is that the first wire always tends to hug the second wire. I think that's the bigger advantage apart from it charting the path See, for you. I, I'm you sure to hug the other wire. I, I'm using the, my good old uh, single operator technique. I'm uh, handling both together, the burr as well as the wire. See, the greatest advantage is the wire, we don't lose the wire position, we don't lo lose the guiding position, we are perfectly uh, in control of everything. When it comes to this bend, make sure you, uh, there will be some resistance, uh, see, the guiding tends to move down, that is because the burr is traversing through the bend, then again it will automatically come, sometimes you have to reposition the guiding. That, that's a perfect demonstration of how single-handed technique is probably better than two-person technique. Yes. Two-hand technique of a single person better than two-hand technique of a two persons. But Matthew, I also want to point out to the audience yeah. that you can do the same one-hand technique okay. if uh, you put the clip into the back end of the introducer. And if you clip, put the clip in the back end of the introducer, then just on a Dynaglide, a single man can also advance it into the... Uh, but, but only thing, Dynaglide, I have, what I have seen is, Dynaglide itself um, rubs against the con uh, in, inner surface of the guiding catheter, and it may gather some amount of poly polythene material, 
onto the burr cutting surface. We had shown that in a couple of slides uh, uh, on the under microscope that uh, it, the abrasive surface get damaged by doing a dynaglide. Mm -hmm. Ideally, this uh, should be the technique which we should use. Uh, we have seen our Japanese colleagues prefer always uh, to go on di dynaglide, but uh, I have enough reason to believe that this would be a better technique. And here again, while exiting the guiding, you have to be watch, watching out. You saw me checking the guiding, whether it is in coaxial position into the left main. And before you exit the guiding catheter, you have to make sure of that. Otherwise, that is one area you can damage the wire and the whole procedure. So now, now we are in position. Ajit, you want to demonstrate how to do the slow cutting? So, oh. so Matthew, yep. while you do the cutting, and we'll come back to just keep recording the cutting because Ajit is ready, yep. and it's uh, very uh, appropriate that we shift. While you do the cutting, please okay. record it, and then give your message to the, uh, to the audience subsequently. Yeah. So can we go to, over to Ajit, please? And Matthew, we see you okay. and, uh, very clearly. Good. Now let us go to the... Um, where uh, rotablator was, go to the picture, go, rotablator pictures, go, scene minus, 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 minus. Go yes, back. this is where we left you. No, no, uh, Ajit back. had started back. cutting. Back. Yes. Okay. The, uh, Go back. back. See, back. you can. Actually, okay, play. This is where we left you. Next. The Ajit cut into the lesion a little bit and then slow down, came back, then moving back, back and forth. We don't do just touching and going. We sustain the pressure for some time as long as the RPM doesn't drop. Advance. Go next. Now you can see the burr is uh, not going, moving forward. There is a f uh, about 5,000 RPM drop. We wait, come back again. So go ahead, go ahead. So it is. It's never good to be in a hurry yeah. to push see, through the lesion. Slowly, yes, you saw the cut. Yeah. It went so smooth and so slow. Don't allow it to jump. Okay. And now we want to know we want to go any further. So next, so we take a small shot, and we realize we have to go a little further. Next, we have to go further from that. And epicranial, we saw that there is some lesion beyond that. Okay, decided where to stop up to the diaphragm. Next, next, go back, go back. Sorry. Cutting and going up to the diaphragm and no further. Stop there. Yeah. Next. Next. W again, wiring without contrast. Next. I mean, this is the OCT catheter now in place. Okay. Um, Chris, we are with you. There were questions whether. We should use a 1.7 fiber. Is it enough? Do you need any other device? <coughs> because you saw a lot of chunks of calcium in this vessel. So what I feel, if it is not too bad, you can try with a uh, NC balloon. If it doesn't work, then take a angiosculpt or uh, uh, cutting balloon. And I agree with Ashok said, uh, when you have multiple wires, I tend not to use uh, 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 flex stone because that blade gets bent f when you, it's a, there is a resistance of another wire extra across. Go ahead. Yes, sir, actually, what I have a doubt that what is the chance of a rotor but trap if you would go very slowly and especially in an angulated vessel? I was actually. No, I, 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 I don't think uh, it happens at all. I don't think. If, if you go slowly, it doesn't, but if you push it, it does. Yes. And that's the thing about the gentle thing that you're not shoving it into the lesion. You are ablating the lesion yeah. gradually yeah. as you progress. An angulated Absolutely. Vessel, angulated. angulated vessel even. Uh, because the worst thing is 
I mean, through experience for the, all these 30 years now, no, 25, 27 years of rotational arthrectomy, that we realize that angulations are even better to go slower yeah. because if you push, you actually have the ch highest chances of perforation as well. So you've got to ease the burr across as you cut. And uh, next is... Because remember, uh, in the angulation, you you've got a bias, a guide wire bias. When you push, what happens? It is straightening happens? that angulation, though you see it as an angle. If you see the wire, it's straighter going to the inferior surface of the vessel in such a situation. So you ease it through rather than push it through because each time you're burring into the media and not just into the lumen. And not only that, the chances of um, burr entrapment is higher if you try Correct. to go faster. The okay. is I think we, are, uh, we don't have much time left. Uh, okay, so uh, let, let's have a look at the uh, OCT post rotor. So um, coming back, we want to get, uh, try to fix this with one stent if possible. And uh, there's no normal vessel here. So we're trying to get as normal a vessel as we can. And this is, uh, this is probably where we want to maybe land our distal stent. Uh, we did uh, a marker from uh, media to media and that came up as close to about 2.5 as we could. Yep. Um, and then we just pull back and uh, let's have a look and see where the rotor's been. So you can see that channel is actually where the rotor's made a channel and chewed up a bit of that calcium, which is exactly what we want. And, and you saw that that was a channel on one side rather than circumferential. Exa exactly right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a huge calcific burden, if you look at that, uh, almost 360 and relatively thick calcium. So uh, certainly I think a rotor was warranted in this case. Uh, and at least we've chipped away at the calcium on one side of that and hopefully that's, that, that is enough to crack it. Uh, again, uh, plenty of calcium, you can see the rotor track. And going to a proximal uh, landing zone, again, as we said, there's plaque everywhere. And so we thought maybe we'll stop here uh, you can see a landmark, there's a, a septal. A septal, septal coming here. And so maybe about five, uh, probably seven to ten millimeters proximal to that septal, we thought that's as normal as we're going to get. And uh, when we measure that, we got 37.8, so we thought a 38 uh, stent. The proximal reference was about three, so we went for a 2538 with a view to optimize it proximally. Okay. Um, now. Uh, we had to do, uh, look at the uh, look at the angio images. You, you see at the twelve o'clock position the septal what Chris was talking about. Unless you are able to identify some vessel like this, the placement of the stent or placement of the, your balloon becomes technically a challenge because you need to have the right measurement. You need to follow that measurement explicitly to have a right position of the stand. That's yeah. what we are doing. We uh, unless you had co-registration. Yes. Unless you have co-registration. Unless we have co-registration. Yes. Here, you, that septal gives us the guideline. Next. The, we are dilating all the way. Okay. Go fast. Go fast. Go fast. Okay. 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 Now, stent is in position. We know the distal end is at the appropriate position where we want. Go back, next. We come to the, uh, where we can identify the septal. So, distal end is fine. Septal is fine. Chris uh, mentioned that he m measured uh, 8 to 10 millimeters of proximal segment is where you want to land the stent. You have to make use of all these devices optimally. Otherwise, there is no benefit of, it's not, uh, just a show of pictures which to impress somebody. This is a pure science. You have to use it. Next. Okay. This is the, uh, de deployed at uh, what is it? 16 atmospheres. 16 atmospheres. Next. Okay. Now, uh, post stand implantation, uh, Chris. Uh, your comments? So uh, let's have a look at the OCT, looking at the distal end. Uh, in fact, the distal end looks really nice. There's no injury at all, no distal edge dissection uh, coming proximally. Uh, we're going to have to accept that in this uh, very calcified lesion, uh, things are not going to look entirely pretty. We talked about malaposition with this chunky calcium. Uh, don't get too hung up on this. Uh, this is always going to be there. You, you can't get rid of it. And I suspect it, it, it's in the long run, it's benign. Um, and it's one of the reasons of malaposition. You just want to make sure your stent size is good. 
uh, with OCT things are going to look ugly but that will heal up you just want to make sure you've got a good stent size and we've got uh, MLA's uh, reaching 4 and 4.7 proximally so we're very happy with that um, and just a, a, a word of caution uh, when you're looking at, if you're looking at malaposition with uh, these rendering devices, when you've got a bit of tissue prolapse and so on, the uh, system thinks th uh, that um, that is lumen and so always, sure, you can take into account the automated thing, but do a quick manual check. Uh, it, it will always hold you in good stead. Um, going back to the proximal end, again, we're very happy that the proximal end, and there's no injury, it's a good size, and uh, we're well away from this eccentric area, which we're very happy about too, because I'm sure we would have got a degree of malaposition here. So the plan was to just touch up the mid and proximal segments with the 3 ONC as we had planned. And, uh, so, so, so can we just... Uh, uh, at least uh, you tell us about how you deploy the stent. Did you post dilate? Uh, is it just an OCT after deployment? At what pressures? I think all those are very important uh, in terms of optimizing the result. So, so Matthew, what did you do? You, you put this 48 millimeters, uh, 30, 38 millimeters, 30 millimeter, 2.5. Yeah, 2.5 end up at uh, 16 atmospheres, you and did, then yeah. we, uh, with the information we have from the OCT. We decided to uh, go with a three millimeter balloon in the mid segment, leaving both the proximal and distal end without the balloon. We did not even go near that, and that is all done. And uh, there, uh, so, so uh, there was one area which we, I wasn't certainly happy about, and I felt that that could be a 2.75 millimeter post dilatation. That was towards the distal half. And uh, I just want, want uh, uh, another look at that uh, uh, previous uh, OCT uh, and, uh, and your and, uh, and Raphael's comments on, on that area, yeah. Okay. Uh, so if you can see that OCT there, we'll go again from the distal end. Please do. And can we have the OCT now large up, please? Nitro. Enlarge onto the screen. I'll just wait until you get that OCT up. Yeah. I think Matthew's got a good result because I can see it on that linear. Yes, in, and uh, because we went up to 16 with the 2.5, we sort of came very close to 2.7. Yeah, yeah. And, and Matthew had done a high pressure pre dilatation. I saw him doing That's that. That's right, yes. And I think that was instrumental in being able to implant the stent with a good result. Yeah, it seems no, fine. I, yeah. I, I just want to re emphasize what Aj Ashok said. See, when you undersize uh, your burr, ideally, the olden days, we would have went up to with a, if, if uh, at least to 1.75 or 2 millimeter burr sometime. And we have play, paid a heavy price of slow flow, no flow and all. Now we don't do that. We only want the plaque modification. Rest we use other devices, especially high pressure balloons and angiosculpt and, and uh, plexto. You need a post dilatation with uh, very high pressure balloons to get an optimal result when we deal with such diffuse disease, cr uh, chronic calcific uh, multivessel disease. I am uh, reasonably happy with the result. Uh, very good. So uh, I think, Matthew, that was a great, sir, great actually, demonstration. Sir, actually, uh, I have a doubt. Which are the situations now you use uh, oversizing of the bar? Which are the situations? Uh, I mean, uh, situation with a very large arteries when we do any of these use any of these devices uh, OCT or IVUS then you see there are a lot of protrusion of calcium into the intima they are the ones do not yield very well to the uh, b b balloon dilatation I in that situation I, uh, I mean upsize the bar so the image, imaging can give a clue for clue for these other cases you have to upsize or not. Imaging yes, imaging be. will give us a lot of information because that is very, very useful. And this case actually the cutting was in actually one side of cutting was more than the other side. Will actually will avoid you to go for a higher size below. Um, see, once you have cut and you, have, you it has gone to one eccentric cut, 
a changing of the burr size is not going to change the cutting surface. You can, you will tend to cut in the same area and chance of perforation gets higher. That is why I asked actually, cutting yeah. if one side will avoid you to go for a high size. Uh, no, you, I would definitely not use a higher size if yes, you have right. an eccentric. You are absolutely right. Uh, once you have guide wire biases, angulations and cutting is on one side, higher burrs are only going to cut more into the median, not the, le not the calcificate lesion. But and the other time you actually go up is when you do an IVAS in a large vessel, which you've done a 1.5 burr and the vessel is 3, and then you see that there's still concentric calcification without eccentric cutting. Eccentric cutting will automatically make you break the lesion. And uh, but if it's only, only concentrically uh, being cut and you still got circumferential calcium or a napkin ring calcium at a particular Ash point, Ashok, you should go up. Ashok, yes, yes, please. We, we selected a case of a reasonably simple, straightforward lesion. This is mainly because this gives us so much of learning. We saw all challenges, we saw decision making, we changed our strategies depending on what we find with the imaging technology. Ajit, you want to tell anything else? Uh, and, and we'll uh, go back to... to yeah, any, any, any comments? No, sir? I think it's uh, what Dr. Matthew said is absolutely right. And uh, in, in terms of... I mean, the, the one thing that we did demonstrate was a slow cutting in place of uh, the pecking method that is uh, practiced very frequently. And especially long segment lesions, we, we, we go very slow in uh, cutting. And as Pratap asked, uh, even in bends, we, we go pretty slow because once this bur the burr slips down, then it will be very difficult to retrieve the burr back uh, the bar will get obviously get stuck in the distal segment. And uh, thank you so much. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thank Matthew. you, was, uh, Thank you, all my yes, cat lab staff. Uh, wonderful. Go, go thank, you. To, to thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Thank it wasn't sir. a simple case, but it was an excellently okay. done, simply looking Perfect. case. How you made it look simple in a very complex lesion. Thank you. So can we then go to Ajit, and I'll come back to you as uh, soon as we have Ajit on our screen. Contrast how much?